Good morning, Motangos, and welcome to another edition of Love and Daily. I'm your host, Chris Perejean, today joined by JP. Uh, and we've got a very interesting show ahead of us. We also have, at the end of the show, an interview with the lawyer of Vince Muscat. Uh, Vince Muscat being uh, the only person so far who's been jailed with the murder of uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia. So uh, we'll just go through the stories of today. Our first story is passport papers, uh, a new revelation of, of documents um, it, by a number of different newsrooms, including Love and Malta. And um, we are revealing that there are written agreements between Henley and Partners and Cambridge Analytica's owner and CEO. Uh, a 17-year-old has shared first-hand experience in a video of sexual harassment on a public bus. Uh, Vince Muscat has detailed the De Giorgio brothers' connections with a number of powerful people while in jail. Uh, the environment minister has got uh, caught up in a crazy Twitter spat and Ian Borge, the infrastructure minister, has told fitness enthusiasts to buy gym memberships. We'll see later why. So uh, we'll start with the first story, the passport papers. Um, this is an initiative of the Daphne Foundation after a whistleblower revealed a number of documents uh, about Henley and Partners. Uh, we've revealed a story that uh, there are at least three written agreements between Henley and Partners and uh, the parent company of Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is a controversial company, a data company that uh, has been accused of tampering with elections at, uh, in, in, various, in various instances. There have been, uh, there were three documents that we've seen. One has been signed and the other two weren't. Uh, the the Henley and Partners are, are saying that they never had and formalized these agreements, but um, obviously this paints a picture. What we, what we know is that there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of closeness between Henley and Partners and uh, Cambridge Analytica's CEO Alexander Nix. Um, I, I think it's interesting as well today that you see all the newspapers with stories about the passport scheme in Malta, right, Jay? Absolutely, yeah. You know, uh, it's a collective effort. You know, uh, Malta's media houses have come together to publish these uh, um, reports. Not even just Maltese media houses, but also international media houses like the Guardian. You know, unraveling uh, Malta's controversial passport scheme. Uh, some stories today also include, you know, uh, how um, properties are being built and rented to these passport owners in Malta and as well as the conditions and, and how they manage to get around to them. So definitely take a, take a look at them and check them out and, and, and stay up to date with that. Moving on to our second story of the day. A 17-year-old has shared her first-hand video of sexual harassment on public bus in Malta. Uh, the young woman um, took to her t personal TikTok to upload a video of uh, this sexual harassment experience she, she, she uh, was part of on, on the public bus. In the video you can see, um, you don't see the, actual, the man himself, but you see his hand and you see, you see her sitting on the bus and this man talking to her, getting quite close to her, kind of violating her personal space. Um, she asks him in the video to, to stop talking to her. He uh, refuses um, and, and continues. And you know, at one point he kind of brushes her leg um, and whatnot. And then um, after you know, going back and forth, he eventually calls her a bitch. Um, and just to put in context, she's just a 17-year-old girl, even not even a woman at this point. So um, the video was uploaded to TikTok. It received quite a number of views, quite a number of supportive comments, but also quite a number of criticism because uh, the man in the video was in fact black. People were saying you were just being racist. Uh, the young girl then uploaded a series of videos explaining herself further, saying that she had politely told the man to leave her alone. Um, she said, you know, at the, as well that the man was, was drinking on the bus, so he may not have been in, in the right frame of mind. Um, and, you know, he even apparently uh, grabbed and sniffed her hair. So despite her appealing for him to leave her alone, uh, he kept on insisting, and um, obviously that then becomes an issue of, of, of you know, harassment in a sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, she said it, the incident was, she wasn't being racist, but obviously you have to understand that, you know, in this situation it's very uncomfortable for women. And unfortunately, over the past week alone, this hasn't been the only incident of sexual harassment uploaded to social media. Uh, yesterday, Mar Loving Malta recounted a story of a woman in Aura who was um, stalked. Um, the other day, we also wrote a story about another girl on TikTok who um, was being catcalled while she was out on a walk. Um, in the video, this girl eventually broke down saying, you know, how, you know, 
whilst there are many good men and boys out there, you know, and we are doing making more of an effort to kind of protect women in society, these in incidences do still happen. And how can women feel safe on the street? So it definitely brings to light um, the issue of sexual harassment that Love and Water has been covering extensively over the past few months in a multi-article series that uh, we, we've created out of a, a survey we did. But Chris, what's your... Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that, um, I mean, we know that these cases happen all the time, right? As in, you speak to any woman and they tell you they've got some, some experience of sexual harassment. I think what's happening in, in recent weeks, as it's happening, for example, uh, in the US with police mm -hmm. brutality, mm -hmm. is that people are starting to film these encounters, starting to talk about these encounters, starting to share them on, on social media. And that obviously sparks a reaction from everyone who has experienced something similar to that, you know? So I think it's, it's great that these... Uh, women are sharing their stories, you know, and it's good because it makes us all aware of a reality that otherwise we might be quite blind to, you know, That's if we're not uh, victims of it. Yesterday there was um, another court hearing where Vince Muscat uh, will be speaking to his lawyer uh, later on in the program about his, his presidential pardon requests. Uh, where he revealed uh, an, a bit of information about the De Giorgio brothers, his accomplices in the Daphne Corona Galizia murder. I think what's really interesting from the court case is how he speaks about how they really didn't expect to end up in jail. They, they felt protected somehow. Um, and even when they were in jail, they, they had various connections. Uh, for example, they got their hands on a couple of mobile phones, uh, which they, they shouldn't be able to get in prison. Uh, and they also um, said that they were, they kind of told him that they were negotiating a bail uh, with a judge, uh, Antonio Mitzi. Um, the truth is the judge uh, refused bail, so, you know, and he also denied uh, the, these, these allegations. Um, but, th but there was talk of, of this 100,000 euros being, being used for, for bail, and, and that's obviously uh, very, very worrying as well. It also tallies with a recording between Melvin Toma and Jorgen Fenech, uh, where Jorgen Fenech is heard talking about uh, Keech Kembry giving him some sort of guarantees on, on bail as well. But, you know, every, every couple of days we hear another uh, court hearing, another testimony, um, which really starts to, to build this picture of this very, very big network around the murder and, and its cover-up and, you know, leaks and, and things like that. So it's, it's a bit difficult to keep up with it all sometimes. But um, as I said, later on, we'll be, we'll be speaking to Mark Sant, who is the, the lawyer of Vince Muscat. Maybe he can help put uh, these things into, into some context for us as well. Yes, and to provide some more context on this, Muscat, along with the Georgia brothers, had recently had a presidential pardon request rejected by cabinet. Um, something they said was a decision made after being advised by the Attorney General and the Police Commissioner. Muscat, also known as Il Koch, who has also been granted a presidential pardon before and turned state witness in the Caruana Galizia case and that of the murder of lawyer Carmel Kirkop in 2015. But we'll hear more about that later with our interview with Mark Sand. Moving on to our fourth story. Quite a bizarre story in terms of events last night on social media as Environment Minister Aaron Faruja got caught up in somewhat crazy Twitter spat with satirical page Biserita and the National Book Council Chairman Mark Camilleri. Biserita, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, a satirical page, yesterday uploaded a photo of Aaron Faruja where he's, you know, in the photo he's looking at a laptop and someone is pointing over his shoulder and he's got a speech bubble where he's saying, how, how can I delete my mom's comments? You know, it's getting embarrassing. Because apparently his, his mom and dad are constantly exactly. sort of po posting comments under his, which, his page. Which is nothing wrong with that. I need to have some, yeah. some support from your parents, absolutely. <laughs> but but um, Faruja, um, who obviously saw us online on Twitter, didn't take to it too kindly. And in fact, um, you know, did uh, quite a... Not, not a right thing by ousting the, uh, the man behind the satirical page, calling him by his, his full name on, on, on the Twitter thread. Um, and even before Biserita could respond, uh, out of nowhere, National Book Council Chairman Mark Camilleri, who's you know, known to be quite outspoken, jumped in. Uh, and that's when things really started to take a weird and, and bizarre turn with uh, Faruja and Camilleri going back and forth, insulting each other like a, a, you know, kids in a school playground, really. Um, and even bringing into question the, the news of, earlier news of the day with regards to the green wall in Halua, which had browned, um, with Camilleri saying that you know, this was awarded by a direct order, and then Faruja retaliating by threatening to sue him. And this is all 
unfolding on a Twitter thread online with mm -hmm. everyone <laughs> being able to see you know, a minister, a sitting cabinet member um, engage in this juvenile, childish Twitter few that you know you expect you know online trolls to be doing. I mean, I mean, if the U.S. president can do it, yeah. uh, you're right. And I guess, <laughs> I guess if Donald Trump can do it, Aaron Farouja gets a pass on this one. But but it's still quite strange, you know, to see it all unfold and, and quite quite bizarre, but quite entertaining. You know, late night entertainment for the Maltese people. Yeah, and and just to add a note about the the green walls. Uh, yesterday we spoke to Minister Farouja as well about uh, why a lot of the uh, green walls, a lot of the plants seem to be dying after so much taxpayer money was spent on these uh, green walls and it seems to have been due to an electrical fault that, that destroyed some of the irrigation and, and so some plants died and, and now that's being fixed apparently not at the cost of the taxpayer. Moving on to the last story of the day, uh, yesterday we spoke to the infrastructure minister Ian Borge and we asked him about the requests, the pleas by fitness enthusiasts who are asking for better, more professional outdoor gym spaces. And what he said was, if you want a gym, get a gym membership, uh, which didn't go down too well on, on social media. You know, a lot of people were saying that um, Malta needs to take this issue more seriously. There's a lot of opportunities as well in having some good uh, outdoor fitness uh, areas. We're investing in these areas anyway, might as well uh, use actual professional equipment and, and make it more appealing to those who take their, their fitness seriously. As we know, gyms are currently closed. People uh, are, are starting to turn to these outdoor spaces uh, more and more, but as they do so, they find that uh, the, the, they're just not up to standard, right, uh, Jay? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, online fitness community, Bulletproof Culture, had uh, you know raised this early on, early on in the week with a video day and, uh, or a campaign they, they launched called Operation Robin Hood, where they highlighted the various outdoor gyms in Malta, which were not just up to standard. Some showing rust, some not functioning properly, even posing health you know hazards. And basically, this kind of kind of the mentality towards, I guess, sports, gyms and fitness in Malta, which has kind of really like kind of taken, uh, come to the fore over the past, you know, month really with the ban on organized sports, the ban on gym and with Malta being one of the most obese countries in Europe, it's kind of sad to see that, the, you know, this attitude we have towards health and fitness, um, especially in an island where you have perfect weather almost all year round, you know, you expect it to have some great outdoor gym facilities for people to enjoy by the beach and whatnot. Um, not a huge investment to make, not, not something that you know overwhelming for the ministry or the government, and I'm sure taxpayers would be happy to use their money to create more outdoor recreational spaces. Um, we also spoke to Ian Borge yesterday about uh, the, the overpaid young lawyer uh, who decided to, to cancel her contract after it was revealed mm -hmm. in, in the press. Um, we'll just cut to a short video of uh, the minister, Ian Borge, talking about uh, this, 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 these outdoor gym spaces and so that you could also hear it from the horse's mouth. And then we'll start our interview with Mark Sant, the lawyer of Vince Muscat Il Kohu. عملنا داك داك البروجيكت كنا ما نيوش بكنا ما يوجبوش نغاسي على البريتي اللي هم فين نسكوز روحي من مال البريتي اللي اوبيامنت اليش اي انسرت تاع المنسترو تاعهم يكلهم يقراو الكومنتي تاع ثاني اللي ما يوجبو مش اي امبورج مش البروجيكت اما ان كونفلو نخدمو ما كان ذا فيتنس كوميونيتي فور اكزامبل واز كومبلينينغ ذا 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 ثينجز اوف 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 اكسس ذا فيتنس كوميونيتي في السنس البيبل هو مين تو يوز ذوز ذوز اكويبمنت يا يا انا هاد بيتشير اللي في السته ناقول عيني في السته ناقول كان متفائل اللي كان دايما مرحبا بيتشي جيبيري ما عندكش عارف فين تمر الجيم جيبيري باش 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 تكون في الفيتنس كوميونيتي بس تستفى لسه هذاك السنة نستناو الليفتنج اوف ريستريكشنز ومن البروفيشنال اللي مر الجيم ما يمر جو اوبن دور جيم ما نبروفاش ما نبروفاش لا يجي فيري ما نبروفاش نرجع كولاو من يرتم مر الجيم يخلص الممبرشيب ويمر الجيم ام سباسي وما المين يهو بياشيري يعمل في تاتيفيتا فيزيكا وينا فوق كلش كونتنت اللي اني ستمك وما كونتنتي مش هيك so 
As we said, that was Ian Borge, and uh, his comments didn't go down very well on, on social media. Uh, if you have something to say, uh, head to loveandmalta.com or Love and Malta's Facebook page and, and have your say. But now we're back and we're joined by Mark Sant, Dr. Mark Sant, uh, the, the lawyer of Vince uh, Muscat, who is accused, uh, not just accused, now sentenced uh, for his involvement in the murder of Daphne Caron Galizia. First of all, uh, Dr. Sand, what's it like to represent someone who, I mean, obviously you're a criminal lawyer, you represent uh, a lot of people, but what's it mm -hmm. like to represent Vince Muscat in such a high profile case and such a horrific murder? So first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, well, it's part of the job. So to be honest, I've been honest with him since the first day. He's been honest with me since the first day, as far as I know. So. It's obviously the case is what it is, but he is another client. Okay, and um, we've seen that this week there was the, the rejection of the presidential pardon, right? Uh, the, the, the second presidential pardon has requested, third. or I guess the, the third, <laughs> right? There's been a number of, so walk us through this journey um, of presidential pardon. I know it started quite early on, no? He was mm -hmm. one of the first people to start talking. Yeah, so basically I entered the scene in around October, November, 2019. So before that, he was obviously arrested and, and accused. So his previous lawyer teams had started talks about a pardon, but this was never, from what I understand, it was never a formal request. There were just talks going on. Now, when I entered the scene, um, maybe a few weeks after I started, I had requested a formal pardon. So I wrote to the president asking him to, uh, to, to give us this, this pardon, obviously, and we went to the process with the police. Um, so in January, February 2020, we went to the depot a number of times and Vince spoke about um, the cases he was ready to, to, to discuss. This took a year for the police to get an answer and they gave us an answer in uh, July, um, sorry, in January 2021. So it took them almost a year to get back to us. Right? After Melvin Doma had been arrested yes, yes, and yes, after Joven yes. Fennec had been arrested. Yes, exactly. So, so is it that... Uh, it wasn't really that um, valuable before, or what do you think was the delay? <laughs> I'd, I'd better not comment on, on video, but uh, <laughs> no, no, um, Vince, it's com it has been confirmed many times. Vince spoke to the police the first time in April 2018, so three, four months after they were arrested. Mm -hmm. This has been confirmed, I think it has been confirmed even in court, so I'm not yeah, re revealing yeah. anything. Which means anything what? New. What does that mean to, to the case? <laughs> well, Vince was ready to talk. Mm. Now, were they willing to listen? Mm. Did, they, did they want to listen? Okay, so you have doubts about whether... whether well, Melvin Toma was mentioned in, in April 2018. Mm -hmm. And he was arrested in November 2019, which is a year and a half. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Now, if, if you're... I don't know, let's not go, let's go, let's not go any, any further into that. Yeah. <laughs> but so the that, situation, that was, so, is... is uh, what's, what's the current situation? Yeah, so, that, so he did was, get a... That was the first request, and it was rejected by Cabinet in January um, 2021. In January, I think of February, I, I requested another pardon in the Kirkop case, which was granted in uh, February, I believe. So that was the second pardon. So at the same time, I think it was 23rd February, we, uh, we took a plea bargain in the Daphne Caruana Galizia case, which is uh, it's public, so he's been sentenced to 15 years, and he has to return um, any proceeds he received from the crime and one third of the court expenses till the date that he pleaded guilty, and um, we got the pardon for the Kirkop case. Yeah, yeah. So it's clear that there is a lot of resistance to giving pardons in the Caruana Galizia case, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and and but although there is the openness for the plea bargaining, as as happened uh, mm -hmm. in in Vince's case, why why are you um, requesting an why why were you requesting mm -hmm. a, another pardon? Then now? we requested so we requested the third pardon <coughs> in order to. So we offered to give information on a number of other cases and obviously a pardon to, to protect ourselves from any other maneuvers also that can be done, as we saw by, by the brothers, for example, by the brothers, mm -hmm. the Giorgio. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, we were trying to protect ourselves also, but we're also offering to give information that Vince has and he... When you say protect yourselves, in, in what sense? Because if the brothers obviously ask for and are granted the pardon, they can obviously then testify against Vince. On other crimes. On other things. So as we know, Vince know about Muscat and the Georgios were career criminals, right? They, they have a number of cases, including a, a bank heist 
uh, or, uh, there's also this 2010 mm -hmm. HSBC bank heist. And very sensationally, one of the, the points being made or that was being made in the presidential part and that was refused um, is that uh, there is a sitting minister who, was, who had a very active involvement in this bank heist. Now, mm -hmm. Uh, we, 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 we understand that this sitting minister is uh, alleged to be uh, Carmelo Abela. He's denied any involvement. He's also sued Jason Azzopardi for, for uh, making this, this link. Uh, he did work at HSBC uh, at the time. But this is, I mean, an, an outlandish uh, accusation, no, as in... Uh, I'm not Jason Azzopardi's lawyer, so what Jason mentioned without, with regards to Carmelo Abela, you know, it's his business. I, we have never mentioned names yet, not even when we went to the depot. Um, when they asked us for the name, we obviously did not give it. Vince has a right, every, everyone has a right to not incriminate themselves. But, but do you deny that it's Carmelo Abelo? You... I'm not going to mention names. What I can okay. say is it's not Jose Herrera because we mentioned it specifically in court in the case we had before his sister, uh, Madam Justice Sherry Herrera. And we asked for her to recuse herself because we believe that although, strictly speaking, in the law, there is not, it doesn't define the relationship between a brother and a sister in these cases. But we felt, I felt, Vince felt, that um, uh, it would be better for everyone if she did not sit on this case, since there is a current minister and the former minister who are implicated in this who, case. Who might be sort of, who, who would obviously be close friends and associates exactly. of the, the, the people the, being mentioned, yes. right? Um, but at the same time, uh, the the rest of the cabinet is also, you know, so where you were asking right. for the whole cabinet to recuse themselves? Strictly speaking, uh, I think there is an interest. The cabinet have an interest in giving or not giving the pardon requested by Vince and by the, the Georgia brothers. Because mm -hmm. in a normal country, I believe <laughs> these types of things would, would lead to the government at least resigning mm -hmm. and calling an election, in my personal opinion. So I think they do have a personal interest. What, what should have triggered the, the, the government collapse and the election? Well, the fact that you have three alleged, uh, not so alleged criminals, <laughs> referring to a current minister and the previous uh, minister, I think that's serious enough to warrant serious action and not to let these things pass by, you know, like another day at the yeah, office. Yeah, yeah. So and, instead, <laughs> and instead it's just being seen as another outlandish... I believe uh, that so far, so by their action, the cabinet has accepted to have a shadow but resting should, over all of them, but except for Herrera, because we specifically okay. mentioned that we don't think it's, it's not him. But at the same time, I mean, these are three people who have uh, clearly assassinated a journalist, um, have no qualms with, uh, with doing something so, so heinous. Why, why should we indulge or entertain the... the why, why should we believe them? Why should we give, give them any sort of credibility? Let me talk about my client. I won't talk about the Georges, but in his case, he has no interest to lie. Why would he lie? <laughs> mm. If he gets caught, if he's given the pardon and he's caught lying, the pardon falls and he can be charged for that, that offence. Mm -hmm. So, why, why, would, why would he start mentioning names left, right and centre just for, you know, the sake at, of it? At the same he has absolutely no interest to, to lie. At the same time, why wouldn't he just tell the truth, right? As in, um, he's done something horrific which has had a huge impact on Malta, uh, even I think our economy and, uh, you know, just the, the reputation of the island, besides the fact that, you know, actually killed one of our leading journalists. Like, mm -hmm. shouldn't he be making up for this somehow by at least just coming clean and, and uh, how, how is he still negotiating this stuff, you know? Well, in Daphne's case, uh, Vince has taken his, his part of the blame. He has pleaded guilty, he has taken 15 years and, as I said, the other expenses, and he has spoken when he could have just sat silent and you know, not mentioned the names he's mentioned. He has no interest to lie, in my opinion, so, you know, the, the names he's mentioned in court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe him because he has no reason to lie. And I've explained this to him many times, you know. But, say, but why not just say it? Why, why is he negotiating it? Well, everyone, I don't think anyone gives you anything for, for nothing, so... Mm -hmm. And obviously he's facing uh, other charges, right? So, yes, so yes. Uh, he, he's, the, 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 when he asks for this third pardon, when, when, when he asks for this third pardon, uh, he's, he's being asked to be pardoned for what exactly? Well, we mentioned the HSBC case specifically mm -hmm. because he, uh -huh. he is being charged with that. So that is a case that's likely to, to take place soon and where he could face more, more jail time for it unless he, well, he so gets... Well, so far we were appearing before Madam Justice Sherry. Russia has recused, she has abstained from hearing the case. 
and now this will be assigned to another judge and we'll take it from there. Okay. And now that the presidential pardon has been refused, so so was the one of, of the, the, the Giorgio brothers, and they were actually dealt with, uh, it seems, to, together, even though I, I guess they're, they're, they're different to an extent. Um, What's the next step? Would you now negotiate a plea bargain like you did with the Daphne Karana Galizia case? Because we know that that pardon was also rejected and it still led to some kind of mm -hmm. um, It's still early days. We're, we're, we're talking, I'm talking to obviously Vince and to his family and seeing what they think. I'm obviously thinking about legal ways we can take sort of and I'll advise them and they will come back to me with what they have in mind. So as such, there's no decision taken yet, we're seeing. So you don't exclude that there could be plea bargaining at, at a later stage, not there for a full pardon, no. but for... for uh, uh, I mean, things are quite flexible, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. it takes two to tango, strictly speaking. So I, I can want many things, but then it's not only up to me to take the decisions. Yesterday we had um, Vince Muscat's testimony about the... Um, him mentioning a magistrate and, and, and uh, the, the, the fact that the De Giorgio brothers got a phone in prison and, and, and things like this. Um, I wonder how, 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 you're, uh, how you're looking at the institutions, right? There's this big discussion about, you know, leaks and cover-ups and politicians and police officers and investigators all somehow conspiring at, at various instances. The, the, the Giorgio brothers themselves feeling incredibly protected uh, mm -hmm. in the run-up to their, their arrest. Do you have faith in the institutions? Uh, it's uh, quite a tricky question. I think there needs to be more transparency. So if these people have been mentioned, and they weren't mentioned yesterday, they have been mentioned months, maybe probably years ago, um, have they been sent for? Have they been questioned? Have they replied to the questions? Has, you know, we don't know what, what's happening. So I think there needs to be a lot more transparency. Obviously, you have to be careful of, to, to protect the investigation also. But I think there needs to be more transparency in how things are being done. But do you have faith in the judiciary? Yes, judiciary, Allah is there. <laughs> I have to practice in front of them on a regular basis. So, yes, judiciary. So, so this claim of, of uh, Antonio Mitzi is something well, that Well, there have been you. claims which have not turned out to be true. And, so and that doesn't mean he, does, th does that mean he's lying, though, when, when those claims no, are made? No, no, it doesn't mean that. If the brothers or someone has told him something and his reply and his forwarding what they told him, it doesn't mean he's lying. Yeah. So, so it could be that even this bank heist allegation is just sort of something that the Georgios told him to, uh, to, mm, to impress him, kind of thing. I doubt it. <laughs> Why? Well, I know what Vince told me. Other people know from other sources and it doesn't look, it doesn't seem to be that type of situation there. I it's think there'll be a lot more coming out in the, in the coming... It's not hearsay, so it's not just hearsay from his end. Let's leave it at that. But I think in the coming days or weeks there'll be more more coming out on, on these types of... On this of case, on the, on the bank heist. There can be others which are maybe not as serious, but similar. In fact, we reported that there was also one of the, one of the cases that uh, Vince Muscat wants to uh, speak about, in the, the, wanted to speak about in the presidential pardon, was an attempt on a, police, uh, on a police officer. Can you confirm this? Can you give us any details about this or any of the mm. other cases he wanted to speak about? I won't give details, but yes, there was a case a few years ago um, against the police officer and he can give information where well, he was not involved obviously but he can give information which he knows okay Thank and there, so there have also been others against police officers which i have confirmed and you know uh, at times um you have to you have to question why don't the police want to solve these cases against some of their own hmm. so it, it, it you gets think you there are them. ulterior motives no I, I don't know i cannot i i won't uh, come here to throw mad at people but it gets you thinking. Because yeah. this is a, a, a key to them to finding out how, how, it's, how it's to solve a, it's a, a number it's, a, of it's a network, it's a web of, you know, the crimes sort of, sometimes they, they're so linked to each other that it's also like a story over a number of years and the story comes together. So, and they make sense, I mean, the police know about them, obviously I'm not going to tell them about these crimes myself, they know about them much more than I do. Yeah. So sometimes you question, why don't they want to solve these cases? Yeah. Why aren't they ready to Obviously, we have to say that it could also be because they have other means of solving them, no? now that they have... Or at it least that, that they don't feel a presidential pardon is uh, the best way of solving them because it's mm -hmm. may maybe too, too much of a... Um, too generous from the, from the country. Yes, but in the cases where he is not involved and he's willing to talk, 
<laughs> Thank you very, very much. I don't know if Thank there's you. anything you want to add, but it was a pleasure no, to speak to you and get some, <laughs> get some insights. Um, we'll obviously keep following uh, the, the cases involving uh, Daphne Caron and Galizia Azmed. Um, and that's it from, from Love & Walter today. Don't forget to subscribe to Love & Digest to get a daily breakdown of uh, our stories. Um, and have a day full of loving. <laughs>